Hi, we are back today with another exciting collaborative episode with the amazing Sanyu Estelle. Hi, Sanyu. Welcome back to the Rise Up Good Witch podcast. How are you doing today? Thank you, Corinna. I am well. Thank you for having me back. It's always a pleasure to talk tarot with you. Absolutely. And one of the exciting things, um, besides these conversations are great, and they're some of the most popular conversations Um, the most downloaded of the Rise of Good Witch podcast, but also we're going to be doing a collaboration in June and teaching a class. Um, Do you want to say what the name of the class is, Sanyu? Yes, we will be teaching the archaic, modern, and pop cultural history of tarot. That's right, folks. Check it out. More info will be um, available for you about registration in May. Um, mid-May, I guess, because this is going to be coming out in May, so later in May. So keep your eyes peeled and your ears open and alert to the news that is abound. So um, for this episode, you know, because we're in a lover's year, we were talking about ways to apply um, cards to not only the archetype of the lovers, but to like a more overarching kind of um, area that we are in collectively. So we decided to call this episode tarot for relating in late stage capitalism in terms of family within society, romance, community, and friendship. Do you want to say anything about that, um, Sanyu, at all? Like why, you know, you thought this was an important episode for us to do? Yes, I remember saying as we were discussing our impending workshop, do come folks, um, that because it's a lover's year, we should probably do a tarot for relating And then you were like, but I really want to add in late stage capitalism. And I was like, okay, so then we should have, I mean, we always have more than one card, but that we should have cards that relate to specific types of relating. Um, Because of course, lots of people like to think of the lovers as like romantic lovers, as opposed to coupled beings um, and, and beings in union. And so we broke it down into five slash six ish card categories (laughs) and we will go uh back and forth about those because corona and i literally do not know each other's cards yeah and we have an idea yeah sorry go ahead oh no i'm just gonna freak out if we chose the same one Um, and that's (laughs) funny i don't remember saying like we have to do relating in terms of late stage capitalism but that sounds like something I would say. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, so do you want to start or do you want me, do you want me to go first or do you want to go first? Um, I think because this feels like a bigger topic um, that we should do each section one and then you, one of us go and then the other one go instead yes, of doing all, all the run through yeah because I think it'll be so much more for us to discuss and like she would oh yeah that would be too hard if we did all of ours and then you did yeah yeah so do you want to start with a card for relating to the self and the shadow yeah so uh what shouldn't surprise anyone who has read our the lovers rise up good witch uh zine in which I wrote an article is my card for relating to the self and the shadow is the world and I have it from Manzel's tarot for the watchers I have it from the melanated Rider Waite and I have it from uh the herbal tarot and you know obviously major arcana spiritual purpose existential purpose conversations with g-o-d um and and the devil for that matter. Uh, but God made the devil and not by accident. So I like to talk, I think about it as the world simply because the way that you see yourself and understand a self to be and understand your range of what you believe you are capable of and therefore what you think anyone else is capable of to me is in direct reflection direct reflection of how you see the world and like the relationship between what is on the world and yourself so it's the same as saying like you treat others the way that you treat yourself but you also believe what is taking place with 
in relationship to what the world has taught you. So it's a reflexive, reflect, refra reflective, I was gonna say refractive, <laughs> reflective, maybe refractive relationship where you understand yourself as you understand the world, you understand yourself as you understand the world, you understand yourself as you understand the world. And, and that means the spectrum of self too, what you'd think is like illuminated and in shadow about you. Ooh, yeah. I love that. So you feel like, do you, I, I just want to ask about this because it's, you know, I love when you talk about the world and I've learned so much from you about working with the world card. Um, and I'm wondering like, so do you think that applies to like, if, um, you know, if you see something like the, you kind of mentioned like projection and like seeing something in the world where you're like, this is unjust, this is not right. But really like, there's a lack of reflection of the self about how like the things in the world that we pick out as being like harmful or relatable or whatever adjective, um, that's something that we have a harder time seeing in ourselves. Yes, yes, and it's more like that thing I don't like doesn't belong here. Okay. Yeah. And, or because I don't like it or because it isn't good or whatever other reason you want to make up about it. But the fact of the matter is that it is there or else you wouldn't have the awareness to have an opinion about it. <laughs> so it's like what the world sees fit to have, you're not in a position to eradicate outside of what you are willing to do through leading by example, through having conversation with people, through allowing them to operate as their own world as well. Because that's another reason I chose this start. It's like, mm -hmm. we're in the world, but we are a world. And appreciating that means you can appreciate that there's like almost 8 billion other worlds on this world. And yeah, and that's in the now you know, that's not to speak of the worlds that were before and that not only individually, but the combination and then the collection of those for any period of time, because people are always coming in and people are always coming out. And the worlds that, you know, have yet to come, which is just another way of saying like seven generations before and seven generations after. Mm. So I think of it as this, in terms of relating, it's like what you believe is or isn't natural determines how you believe people should be. Mm. And of course, that would include you first and foremost, because that's really the only person that you have any genuine authority over. True. And that's an interesting segue into my card, which is the hermit. Um, and I was telling San, yeah, I was telling San Yu, I randomly, so I sat down for this list that we made and I randomly chose a card. And then I sat with it and decided if that was the one that I wanted to go with. And the hermit was one that came out randomly. And I was like, yes, this one works. So I think like the hermit um, as a relating to the self or the shadow is important. And it will tie into some of the other cards and, and topics that we talk about because you know we are moving away from the hierophant um and into the lovers and the the thing about that is we go to pro proliferation when we get to the lovers because it's not just about the relationship with the self it's about the relationship with the the external and internal like the mirror the self within and the self in the mirror or um, partnership or relationship or whatever. So I think like the hermit comes through because it's important, like no matter where we're at, no matter how many people we're around, no matter what type of privilege or power we hold, we always need to have good self inquiry and good practices for checking in with ourselves. So I think sometimes like, you know, for me, when the hermit comes up a lot for like a client, I often think like you're not listening to your own internal compass. You're not listening to, um, your, maybe you're seeking validation. Maybe you're trying to find an answer outside of yourself and the answer is within you. Um, and that also contains the shadow um, because, you know, a lot of times, kind of like what you're saying about the world, like, yeah, we don't, we often, you know, can, and I'm being very general when I say we, but like um, people can very often like see things, um, in others that they cannot see in themselves, whether that's like 
a quote unquote negative quality or a positive quality. You know, it's easier sometimes to see that externally than to see it within. And the hermit interrogates that, you know, I think there's something about the hermit, you know, the hermit is the crone who like all, all that they have is that old rickety lamp, you know, everything is dark. They can't see anything. All they've got is that lamp. So they have to have that divine trust with that. And they have to um, be inquisitive about their own nature, their own, the way that they're coming off. And a lot of times we, you know, again, I'm using we very generally, but hu the human species under late capitalism can sometimes feel like we don't have that, um, that understanding that our perception is solely that. It's our perception. If I think someone glared at me and is being rude to me, that's my perception. That doesn't mean like that person glared at me and is being rude to me. That's like a very like shallow example, but it's like an example I think everybody can kind of relate to in some way, just like our perceptions are not our truth, you know? And that goes back to like the episode I did a few episodes ago on the three of swords, like feelings are not facts. I think that the hermit is like, it's very um, level. It's like, it can tell you the most devastating news or the harshest criticism with like the most calm voice, you know, like a calm, soothing voice. So for me, I, when that card came up for the self and the shadow, I was like, of course, because the hermit is like, all you've got is this rickety old lamp how are you going to see your truth with this? Because that's what you have to do. You have to somehow learn to see your own truth. I like that. And I think that that's so, I mean, it's funny because the internal external of the world is like you and the planet you're on. And it's true of the hermit too, but it's from a like one-to-one -one situation with the with the hermit you know because all you do have is this little staff and you old and like you you move slowly and you ask a lot of questions and then with the world it's like the world comes at us really fast you know but we're constantly making up and processing who we decide we are through that the repetition of that experience yeah so there's something very like it's interesting they're like related but yeah. And I thought about the hermit, like when I passed it in one of the decks, I was like, yeah, this would be one of the cards, but I had already basically had them. And I was like, I'll, you know, mm, it's not yeah. strong. So I'm not going to go for that for me, but I like what you had to say about it. Yeah. So I guess the next one, a card for relating to the nation state. Yes. So, I mean, I guess I'll have to go first because we 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 have like a level that, but this is not fair because then I don't know any of your cards first. <laughs> you can switch after this one if you want. Okay, we'll do, yeah, we'll do two and then we'll switch and then whatever. Okay. Uh, but so for this card, I chose uh, for the card of relating to the nation state audience, I chose the seven of wands. And this is actually one of the first ones that before I even opened a deck, when I was thinking about it in my head, I thought would be uh, for the nation state. It's like when I was looking at the deck and looking at that, that particular question, this is the one that came first to me in my mind. And then this is the herbal tarot one. But um, I, I, I can't remember which tarot for we did it we talked about this in, but we were talking about the wands journey from like five to six to seven. Yeah. Right. Like you come out of this like battle and you're in this like temporary relief of being welcome home. And there's that celebrating of the fact that like you returned and you didn't die, even though you realize that a version of you died for sure. Like a you, version of you was left on the, on the battlefield of the five wands. And then you're coming home in victory, but then oh, you get to seven and you're like back on the defense. Like, why are you back on the defense? Mm. And so for Tarot for the Nation State, I'm like, yeah, of course it's like perpetual seven of wands because you're, it's a construct. And 
it demands of you, if it does not operate with integrity, more than it gives you. And so you're constantly back on the defensive. And it's the same way that I was saying, I don't remember, I might've been saying this to my friend, Katara, who I do my this week podcast with, but like, you know, frontline workers were heroes, but they couldn't cure the shit. So now Ukrainians are here, but that's going to get expensive. So then someone else is going to be the hero because it's like, if you don't solve the issue for the nation state or you don't resolve the debt, which it incurs, <laughs> then you are questionably, you are, your position is always in question. Your position of security is always in question. Your position of sustenance is always in question. Because of course the nation state is also a capitalist state, even if it says it's not, it is working in a capitalist world. So it will have a capitalist arm, which will cor corrupt the state, right? So like in that sense, every victory is temporary. And especially with the wands, it's like you go from the seven, eight, like more, and then nine, like even more, and then 10, you know, like, um, of course, the Knight of Wands is the most dangerous card in the tarot because that journey is like one of constant ownage of what is put on you to defend like the morsel that you were promised, which you're not even getting. So I like the Seven of Wands for it because it's that I feel like love of the nation state is understanding or why you don't need it. So when you're getting to that seven of wands, you're like, this isn't safe. Like, these, we aren't the heroes. This isn't, work. it doesn't work. How can we afford this celebration only to find out that while we've been gone, the people have been starved. And so they don't even have food, but to put on this presentation of the nation being successful, now you've like, put people even more out right because I was like where is where do we get 800 million <laughs> where did we get 800 million for Ukraine when they couldn't even scrounge up like a third check from the government for people on the ground so it's just like this posturing from the six of wands but I didn't choose the six of wands because the seven I think like when you're actually in intimacy with the nation state you have these questions mm -hmm. and like um it's like I, I'm I'll butcher the James Baldwin quote but he says something along the lines of you know if I love you I have to make you aware mm -hmm. and so I feel like the seven of wands gets to that and I really like Manziel Tarot's version because it's completely not like beholden to the right or wait because he's not a tarot reader he's just an artist but look this like beseeching like this what is this for and like is it going to do what it says it's going to do or what is it what is it capable of because of course there's always members of the nation state who do have you know gallant and noble intent yeah but that isn't what the nation state is for <laughs> so you can't live in the six of wands you always going to start getting your back against the wall when you recognize that kind of intimacy. So that's why I chose the seven of wands. Ooh, that is so interesting. So I always think about the seven of wands, like the seven of wands is a card. I think we, yeah, we talked about it and adapting to a post, whatever the name of that one was, that long one that we did last September. Um, Yeah. And I talked about that as like a maladaptive defense mechanism, but I feel also like the way that you explained it, I thought of like, I always think of the person that's, you know, the the loudest person in the seven of wands is the person that you see you don't think really about those seven people standing below but maybe those are the gaslighters that are like come on trust that everything's going to be okay and then the person like that you see is like no i don't believe you you know so thank you for sharing that so the card that i picked for this was the queen of pentacles and i'll Ooh. also say i feel like it could be and I believe that one was one of the ones that I don't remember, but I think it was, but I, you know, I think it could be either 
queen or king. Um, and the reason for that is, and I think this is kind of like a more positive way you know you know that i hate positive versus negative but it's more kind of like encouraging i think is the queen of pentacles because queens again have great boundaries like in the meme that i made that like it was very like people had a lot of opinions about it queens don't burn out the idea behind that is not that a it's not like a, a weaponized thing about oh a real queen would never burn out a real queen can work forever that's not what that means what it means is that Queens don't burn out because their community is always supporting them. Queens don't burn out because they always receive reciprocity because they live in a world in which people rec recognize that queens offer valuable resources to the world and that in order for queens to sustain, they need to be supported. So to me, that's a lot like our good old Mother Earth. Um, and I think like thinking about um, relating to the nation state as we're recognizing that it's not, you know, I just saw some like Apple news alert that was like Biden considering canceling student loans. And I was like, I'm not going to let myself get on that roller coaster of hope, you know, like I'm not gonna, you know, and just like also, you know, climate change. I just saw something else that was like, we've been waiting, like gas, you know, climate scientists have been saying since the nineties that we shouldn't be using fossil fuel. And there's all of these things that are like, you know, for-profit prison systems continue to exist. And it's just like, all of these things are things that as individuals, we don't have a lot of control around them. But what we can control is like the way that we nurture our communities and each other. So what I think with the Queen of Pentacles is that we see this, you know, because it's earth, um, earth water, I think about like these luscious, like beautiful landscapes that have been preserved because of the care that the people that live within those landscapes give back to the land. Um, and I also think with um, Queen of Pentacles, again, like Queens Don't Burn Out means that a queen can take as many breaks as they want. They can rest and sleep all day if they need to, but their energy will not be, um, what's the word? Like they can't, their energy can't um, be depleted. depleted is the word I wanted. Yes, depleted because they have that space to care for themselves and thus care for others. So I think like seeing ourselves as like a human collective, seeing ourselves as like we are responsible for each other. And that kind of plays into another card that I, I picked for uh, another one down the line here. Um, but like a queen of pentacles is so bound to the earth and to the body and to like the logistics of things. So it's not about visionary thinking necessarily. It's not about ego. It's about like grounding possibilities into our life. And I think there's also an element of realism, which I think you know, not that King of Pentacles at its most evolved is, because uh, in Tarot School for Liberation, I talk about how like unevolved King of Pentacles is like a lot of uh, factory farming, you know, um, paving over like, you know, greenery for like parking lots and stuff. Like that's very unevolved King of Pentacles. But I think like Queen of Pentacles knows what they're capable of and what they aren't so there's not you know there's it's too easy in kings to fall into a sense of isolation or power over whereas queens thrive in community because they don't burn out so a queen knows what they are capable of and what they are not capable of so they don't try to take everything on unlike a knight of wands you know they don't try to like do everything they're just like i'm here i'm with the earth i'm like making sure the rivers are flowing um the government doesn't care if the, you know, the nation state doesn't care if the rivers are flowing, but here I am with the rivers. You know, it was really interesting listening to that. And I completely agree with all of it, but it also just inspired me. I was like, oh my God, we totally have to teach something one day on like the story of each of the suits, right? From like two cool. to the ace before you jump to the major arcana because I realized while you were talking about it I was like oh you know you're really talking about like an exalted queen of pentacles mm. um because the other the only other thought I had when you were talking was the queen of pentacles knows how to get hers so or theirs for that matter mm -hmm. so like if they're not operating like because it's the nation state right so like if they're not operating in the authenticity of that energy they're gonna get theirs right like 
That's no true. matter what. <laughs> yeah. But you were talking about that exalted Queen of Pentacles, which is why that made me think of the story of the suits, because when we get to those aces, each of them represents their own kind of victory. But like the victory is highly dependent upon the journey that the suit went on and like what they were trying to catalyze through that that victory. So it's like, yeah, I think that's really interesting. Mm. Queen of Pentacles. Exalted, yes. Um, so should I go on to, because our next one is a card for relating to the lover slash partnership. Yes, I would love for you to go okay. first on this Okay, one. so this one, and I'm really curious what you say about this, um, since we share some similar identities in terms of like the ace spectrum. So for me, it's harder for me to choose like a card for relating to a lover or partnership because I have been, you know, without like disclosing too much, I have been on like a journey of like healing some of the wounding that that caused me to choose uh, lovers and partnerships that were very fundamentally unhealthy for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I chose for that was the Ace of Cups. Um, and I think- Speaking of aces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like one, oh, oh yeah, speaking of aces. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I feel like with the Ace of Cups and this, this one, I think actually this one did come up randomly. And then I was like, well, you gotta work with this one. Like this one's easy. Is this idea of like, you know, in a society or in a world in which hyper individualism is encouraged and um, wealth is encouraged over compassion, um, success is encouraged over vulnerability. We have to think about like whatever it is inside of us that we share with others or no, whatever it is that is inside of us, we will inherently share with those closest to us. So therefore we have a responsibility to heal ourselves. So I think about the Ace of Cups a lot as someone on my own like trauma healing journey. And um, what it's about to me is making sure your cup is full. Like you can fill your own cup and there's not a bunch of like holes in your cup. So you're just getting depleted all the time. Like having a cup, you know, that's like a really nice, pretty like ceramic cup that's like very thick and like doesn't have any cracks in it. And you're like doing the work to make sure if a crack appears, you're like sealing it up because you don't want to lose any of that water. So I think like, you know, to be in a relationship or a partnership with another person, you have to really have that two of cups energy of like, we both show up to this with our cups full. We're not coming to each other to be like, fill my cup up. I'm freaking out. Like nothing's going right. Like give me some water in my cup, you know, because that's depleting and it's not sustainable in the long term. Like those things create imbalances and they're not sustainable. So I think like in the world that we live in, you know, all the lack that we experience collectively and the, you know, inner critic and um, a rise in, you know, like mental health issues. Uh, we have to recognize that like, we can't find, you know, I, I've also struggled with being like, I'm going to heal everyone. And like, you know, former social worker here, like I'm going to make everyone else happy. And that way I don't need to make myself happy. You know, there's so many ways that we can approach partnership in a cis het patriarchy that are so toxic and enabling of abusive and toxic patterns. Um, but like, if we show up like, fully ourselves with like our needs met um then like I think we can move towards like more liberatory partnerships mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that I also really like how you referred to the ace and then the two because it made me think specifically with the suit of cups like the end is the beginning it's like as soon as you get it there you go again mm. having to learn how to get it and because you actually have to like feel your way through that shit. Um, yeah. And you don't know until you're going through the feelings how much you've actually processed. So like the fact that ace would be the top and then you come up then with your full cup from the ace, you can enter into the relationship. You know, it's giving like spiral energy. Um, I really love that. And it's perfectly in alignment actually with mine because I didn't choose the ace but I did choose the seven of cups for a card for relating to love to the lover partnership and I and I totally agree that it has to do with um deconstructing 
our relationships from late stage capitalism, deconstructing our relationships from patriarchy and deconstructing our relationships from classism, where the way that I think about how patriarchy um, inserts itself into any kind of gendered relationship or non-gendered relationship is that there is a, a single authority in which you are re in relationship to, but under in the sense that like, if you do something to offend this energy or if this person says something is offensive, then that's the unequivocal truth. And you will be judged in, in the world in relation to that truth to that person. Um, in the same way that patriarchy says, you know, the feminine androgyny, it's less. So that's just what it is. And everyone's like, yes, you're right. You know, it's like, is this hypnosis? Um, and then the deconstructing of the classes aspect is saying, oh, well, because we have this kind of intimacy, it's more important than any other kind of intimacy. It's more important than your relationship to your sibling. It's more important than your relationship to that stranger on the street who just helped you come to a relation. It's more important than your friend relationships. It's more important than your parent relationships. So it's this idea that like, now that we're partnered in this way, I come first. Um, because you're never first, you're always second, right? Like you are, I am first with me. And then whoever I choose to align myself with comes after that. Mm -hmm. And whether I, I'm acting as whether that's the case or not, that is what is happening to the, as much as I understand it. But I also chose the seven of cups. And it's funny because first of all, when I said, speaking of aces, I was thinking about my suit trajectory, but also a spectrum. Yeah. So like, <laughs> come through synchronicity. But I was thinking about that because on the A spectrum, at first I was gonna say, I'm a spiritual ace, not a cultural ace. But then I thought, okay, well, let me compare it to what we actually say already. So I'm not a religious ace, I'm a cultural ace, hmm. which is I am more likely to just choose my own companionship if I don't find that I'm with someone who can grow with me as I'm learning myself. And so my intimacy with myself will be paramount instead of the goal of being in a relationship just to be in a relationship mm. um, or for any of the creature comforts that people obviously choose to be in relationship for, which is like a semblance of intimacy, a type of intimacy. Um, and at the same time, I, I think I haven't really, and <laughs> I don't know how many other people, that's why I call myself a flexible asexual too. I don't know how many people imagine it this way, but it's like, I probably have not really aspired to romantic relationship and like the magazine stuff didn't really work on me in any of those ways or like all the conditioning that you get as a girl didn't really work on me simply because I've not yet really witnessed a relationship that is romantic that I would aspire to have the same quality of. My parents were amazing parents, but they were partners. I don't like, I was more familial than like romantic, you know, like with all the bells and whistles and the, and the things and us together, you know? And I know that there are relate examples of those kinds of relationships that we are presented with, but none of those particular ones, you know, whether it would be like a Romeo and Juliet, a Bonnie and Clyde, a Jay-Z and Beyonce, like I don't aspire to any of those typical relationships because my, because I have a queer spirituality too. So it's like, there's so many factors beyond just being with someone that <laughs> me being with someone would come with. And so I haven't aspired to it or really centered it. And I'm perfectly comfortable with my own company because I basically just don't know if it exists, which isn't to say that it can't. It's just that like, I don't see that to a great extent, which is actually changing. There are a few relationships that have come more and more into my periphery that I'm like, oh, that looks like it honors differences, but like it's highly communicative and very intimate and still very like playful and affectionate and joyous, joyful. That's what I mean by playful and affectionate, mm -hmm. but like joyful. But I feel like Seven of Cups is take your choice now. And yeah. considering all that I just said, it's like, also there's like 8 billion of us. So your romantic relationship isn't saving the world. Like, that's why I don't aspire to Bonnie's and Clyde's and Romeo and Juliet. It's like our relationship isn't going to like change the world unless we are changed 
and come to each other with the willingness to change. So it's like, it's not us that does that. It's like two, you know, gears that move. And if they do their jobs and stay in their lanes and get all the proper treatment that they need to get treated with, then they work well together. But like, it's more about the sort of health of the actual thing than it is that this relationship allowed me to do these things. Because I'm sure there's plenty of relationships that we've all had that have presented us with opportunities that we did or didn't take that we should or shouldn't have taken. So it's all about where you're at. And so the Seven of Cups is like, I really like it in the traditional um, like rider weight because it's like all these cool things, mm -hmm. right? Like all these things are interesting and have a story and you're like, why are these things in the cups? And then, but this person is like in a state of stasis, overwhelmed by choice. You know, I walked into the supermarket to get toothpaste and there were 50, 50 kinds of toothpaste. I walked out with no toothpaste. So I think that we, and this is such a binary, like, drip down uh, or like permeation from binary culture and from supremacy ideationist culture, but this idea that choice is overwhelming and that if it's not clear, it's not good, you know, but clear to you is what we really mean by that. Mm -hmm. And so with the seven of cups, when I get it, I'm like, you know, what makes, when you stand in front of your closet, what makes the purple sweater better than the green jacket, how you feel who you are at that moment that day and so relationship wise what is the right relationship the one that helps you become more of yourself but that's a dynamic thing so of course it's not going to be one cup it's not even going to be one version of the partners that you have it's not going to be one version of you so it's great that you have seven cups because like if one cup isn't doing what it needs to do in order to help you become more of yourself there are six other cups at least and if you actually took the time to clear those seven cups you'd find there were 10 right and like and then you'd find it was one big ass cup the mm. ace but you have to let yourself choose and know that the choosing is what teaches you and that what teaches you is how you feel about yourself who you can be in relationship what you can have in the world how you can show up for other people how you can be seen because of course cups ruling the emotions is and is going to be dynamic and really subjective based on the environment because water is always going to concede to the environment so i think the seven of cups gives us like this is more light-hearted then we have made it, but also there are a lot of choices. So like, you don't have to settle on any one thing. That was amazing. I feel like I got so many ideas from that. Um, and I also, you have Venus and Aquarius, right? That is, I do, I do, I I do. as well. And I feel like Venus and Aquarius, like it's a very unconventional position to have for your Venus like the sign of Aquarius is very like I think of that card as being very Venus and Aquarius like so many things and like I'm gonna change my mind in two days like yes. that type of energy <laughs> um so I love that um yeah and then like then when you're talking you're like there might be 10 cups and I was like and maybe all seven cups are dirty in the sink and you just need to clean them <laughs> like they're all need to get you get a dishwasher I don't know um so, okay, the next one we had was um, a card for relating to community. Now, my choice might seem odd, but I okay. chose the 10 of wands. Um, okay. Yes, because I, and I know that I talk a lot of shit, I'll just say the word, about the 10 of wands, but I'm trying to kind of look at the cards that I've had these like very um negative for lack of a better word uh opinions of and kind of reframe them and the reason i chose kind of one so first of all i wanted to start by saying this last weekend i 
read or I listened to the audiobook of Complex PTSD by Pete Walker. I know a lot of people tell me have talked of it to me about that book. And it talks about how complex PTSD is when um I mean I'm gonna give like this is like shorter than a cliff notes, but how the four trauma responses, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn like are constantly activated in like a chronic PTSD mind. So, and then people tend to go towards one and one of the ones, so I then, okay, I'm like going off here, but like then I on TikTok made a video where I chose two cards for each one of the trauma responses. And for Fawn, one of the cards I chose was 10 of wands. And um, I shared it on my, on my Discord channel and a few people were like, that's so weird. Like, but I get it. I get 10 of wands for fawning. And the reason is, is because you know, we, in order for us to relate to community in like a way that rejects like late capitalism, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a lot of work. And that's something that I see, you know, in mutual aid groups that are popping up is like, yeah, if somebody in your neighborhood that's been your neighbor for years is going to lose their house because of an eviction, is the community just going to be like, well, sorry about that, dude, like ask the government to give you some help, you know? Or are people in the community going to come together and support that person? And that those situations are happening with more and more frequency now because of the state of the world where like someone in your neighborhood is sick and they live by themselves and they need someone to deliver groceries. So what are people going to do? Yes, you know, a lot of people say, well, that's what ta my tax dollars are supposed to be paying for. They're supposed to be paying for those people to get help. But is that happening? No. And when it doesn't happen, what do we do? Just sit back and be like, well, we can have an election in two years, let's vote then. Or are we going to be like, I will bring this person food. I will, you know, make a donation or start a GoFundMe for this person to not get a, you know, not lose, get their house foreclosed on or whatever. You know, what is it that we are willing to do? And the, the truth of the matter is that's work. It's not not gonna be work. Um, and one of the things I think about living in the society we live in today in like a pretty toxic capitalist structure is that, the whole idea or like the whole idea of like social media was to make things easier. Everything's supposed to be easier. You know, like the original thing with social media was like, it's going to save you so much time, which is laughable now, you know, it's like, who does, who saves time by having social media, you know, because it takes so much time. So that's the idea is that a lot of the things that we were taught to do out of convenience that would make our lives better are actually um, making us less connected and if we want to go back to having a community where we can rely on one another and care for one another we're going to have to do a lot of work and of course like the reason i chose fawn response for that is because it can be a fawn response to be like i will do everything like i don't want anyone to have to do anything i'm going to do everyone to make everyone happy and that's sort of the shadow of that is like you wouldn't want to pick up all 10 wands and carry them by yourself that would be counterintuitive to this whole process of connecting better with community but i do think 10 of wands shows that like yeah we're all gonna have to bend over and pick up 10 giant pieces of wood and carry them in this like new vision of our world because we're not seeing it happen by powers that be so we have to do it ourselves we are the powers that be true we are the powers that be. This is, I was like, as I was listening to you, I was like, oh, you know, it's so funny because with tarot, of course, you're we're choosing based on our perspectives. Because I also chose a ten, but I chose the ten of pentacles, which mm -hmm. is I think more on the nose, right? Um, and I was like, did I choose the ten of pentacles while you were talking? I was like, did I just choose the ten of pentacles for like rosy colored positive reasons? And I was like, no, I mean you were talking about the exalted queen of pentacles in relation to the nation state, which surprised me actually, because I thought you were going to choose something that was like, and this is a representative of the man, you know? <laughs> so, but with the 10 of, I totally get the 10 of wands because we do have to do it and there is a lot to do. And clearly the powers that we have put in place to assist with that burden are doing as little as possible, which because you're, a, pretending to occupy a role that you're not actually occupying creates even more duress on the situ situation because you're taking up space that you shouldn't take up and 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 not claiming that right and so 
everyone has to carry that slack called shit doesn't get done. Mm-hmm. I chose the 10 of pentacles because a card for relating to community is very much to me about what we decide is valuable, um, how we value community, right? Because 10 of wands is like, this takes resources. And for me, 10 of pentacles is we are resources. Mm. And you need both of those to know either. (laughs) You need both of those to know either. So with community, it's like, what is the, what are these people made of that I am in community with? That can include just the neighbors that you move next to, right? Because like in a crisis, are those people going to help you or hinder you? Um, And that's the sense of community too. And then of course, there's the community of our work environments and the community of our general relatives and then the community of our friends and our choices, right? Even the community of our exes. (laughs) So there's all these communities being formed and how we allow them to take up real estate in our order of focus energy, attention, appreciation, tribute has very much to do with how we believe they, how valuable we really believe they are, which isn't to actually say positive, neutral or negative, because a lot of things have a lot of negative value. I think about this all the time. In fact, I had a a funny joke talking to two people who live in Palm Springs who were uh, talking shit about LA, but being from LA, I hear this all the time, of course. And I'm like, you know, it's so fascinating because it's like, you know, LA, we give you something to talk about, right? LA gives you something to hate. So we give you life. Like we help you create an identity, a personality, an opinion. And it's through that process that we bring value. You're, you give your haters life. Like they want to hate. So give them something to work with, feed them, you know? Um, And so whether something is of positive, neutral or negative value in society, it is never without value. And what value it has is in constant negotiation with not only the community that's communities that you're born into, Mm -hmm. the ones you believe you're possible, believe are possible, the ones you construct in 10-4 or allow yourselves to be involved in. Um, and then that's also a very like environmental relationship too, because mm-hmm. um, something I love that Bashar says is location is a quality of a thing, change the location and you change the thing. And I love this truth and I'm sure you have too, but like Sanyu of LA and Sanyu of Amsterdam and Sanyu of upstate New York were different Sanyus because the environment required mm. different aspects of my character, of my personality, of my, of me. And until I was in that environment, I didn't necessarily know I had those versions of me in me. Um, because they hadn't been called for, right? And the way that I describe this to clients usually when I'm talking about this sort of thing is like, you know, the first time you go to Europe or the Caribbean Caribbean, and you're like, people live like this all the time. You mean just like having coffee in the middle of the day at their leisure or when there's work or, you know, just dipping into the Caribbean ocean and like eating fish if it pleases them and like maybe even catching that fish themselves. But it's until you see it, you don't realize that like that's someone's whole world. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be in that world, environmentally speaking, to appreciate what affects it, how it is valued to you in proximity. Because of course, value is about relationships between yourself and everything, including your activities and your vices and your whatever, whatever. So I like it for this because I like the tens in general to for, because it is, a whole activity. We can't be in community with ourselves mm-hmm. because we wouldn't have 
any true knowledge of what community was with only a self. So it's definitely relationship based. And I think it's because we have such trash values that we are in a 10 of one situation where mm. it's like, oh, we have so much shit to like, if not turn around, like buck back a little, like just a little, <laughs> just a little bit, um, if we can. And even that effort, you know, will be seemingly gargantuan. Mm -hmm. But then our relationship to what about what matters, what's material, what what should be material, what is valued, lessens that burden. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, of course, you would go after what you value. So if you start to just value that sort of thing, then it doesn't feel like an obligation. It's just like what you would do. It's purpose. Mm -hmm. love that yeah love ten of pentacles i feel like it is like the more evolved like i feel like ten of pentacles is like the way of relating to community when we have like some basis around it or some have some ground to stand on and like ten of wands relating to community is like okay this like you, we gotta just throw this together like come on <laughs> you know we're at war <laughs> yeah like so i think that it's interesting the way we both picked a 10 and and also like you saying like you can't get to you can't you know in the 10 you're in the community like you can't build community with yourself and like the 10 of wands as as folks know like in the smith rider weight it, it is a person by themselves and I think like, you know, and I've talked about this a lot and I definitely do in Terra school um, where then, yeah, you look back on that seven of wands, which you brought up and there's like defensiveness and the dividing line. And then I always think like, well, then this person just ends up alone. They've alienated everybody that was in their community. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, do you want me to share? So the last one we chose was a card for relating to family and lineage. Do you want me to go first or do you want to go first? I can go first on this one. Okay. I've, I've, when I chose this or it chose me, I feel like it might seem like an unusual choice for me, but maybe not. But I don't know how well I am at interpreting what I, kind of tear reader I seem like I would be. <laughs> but my choice for a card for relating to family is the star. And I have them in these three, you know, for the for the video watchers. So I chose the star because, you know, so often, I mean, we're in my ancestral altar and we're just in my altar space in general, which is where I work from. And I, I find the most ease um, in being and the most productivity. But like when I pray to my ancestors, I'm not simply praying to flesh and bone relatives i'm talking i'm praying to environmental elemental ancestors right i'm 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 praying to cosmic planetary ele like particular element ancestors because of panspermia and the fact that i am made up of many other solar systems of which i will never know the name and that there had to be trees and water and fire and earth before I could have a body that could house my consciousness awareness of these things that have been around for like millennia more than me. So I think of the family as everything, not just the bloodline that you're born into on the linear path called, this is my family tree. I am the descendant of so-and-so. These are the people that I knew and grew up with. If I even knew and grew up with them, if I even know their names, but also the, the, like in the way that like, you know, when we're watching a film in a movie theater, like the whole role is there, right? The whole story is there, but they're playing it in a linear way that tells the narrative in a certain way. But it's like, you can cut up all those slides and it would tell a very different story. But I feel like if you roll out that slide, that doesn't, that goes on forever. Mm -hmm. it's, there's also slides up, down, sideways, backwards. And so when you drop into a person, you're dropping into that, like the cosmic coordinates of a great many things. And so the star is like, I call it my primordial cording. My, I have my ants, I have my actual physical bodily cording, umbilical cording from my family and 
the inheritance of that, the de genetics, the DNA, but then I have my primordial hoarding, which is the fact that I am of tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of beings who per like persisted knowing nothing or knowing what they thought they knew or thought they knew, but thinking they knew everything. And that life continued without them, but I'm still related to all the worlds that they were a part of because I am made of them. Mm -hmm. And so it's like when I tell people whatever happened on earth stays on earth, meaning like as of yet, everyone that we know who has died has not been launched into space. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you are literally on them. So when I talk about pentacles, I usually tell people it's like lineage, legacy, because your ancestors are dead and in the fire, they're dead and in the water, they're dead and in the air, they're dead and in the earth. And they're in spirit, right? Like you are made from their genetics, the descendancy of their genetics. So I chose a star because it's about this bigger story. Like, and in Ifa too, um, which listener is the indigenous tradition of the Yoruba people of Nigeria, but like in Ifa, you come into a particular lineage on a familial level to get things done. There are specific lines of people who are incarnating to get things done. This is also true as far as I know in Aboriginal cosmology, which is like Aboriginals believe that you will only be reborn as an Aboriginal because they have a specific destiny and a, and a specific agreement with Earth. And their cosmology is more about them being like fifth dimensional people from a, from a different solar system. And then even in Ugandan culture, my father's culture, each of you belongs to a clan and each clan is associated with an animal and that animal is associated with animal medicine. And you will incarnate into that clan to help forward that, pra that the practice of that clan, right? So it's like, you know, you are born and you choose the line down to what you will be participating in, what you will be learning, what you'll be able to contribute, whether that seems contrary or not to what is taking place on the ground in the family on a cosmic level before, you know, opinions and judgment and, and all the feelings jump in, you have an intention to help the narrative along. And that would be done in the consciousness awareness of everything that you know from a heavenly perspective about what came before you and after you because obviously heaven is a place out of time and space so i like the star because it's that too right like mm -hmm. we're like that's a star but it's a sun mm -hmm. and that's a solar system and so our stars are just other people's neighborhood friend you know like as casual as we take our own sun and yet for us, there are things that we aspire to and that we also like think of in a way that is beyond further, bigger than us, mm. further than us, a dream even. I love that. I love that image of now I just have that image in my head of like the star is like one picture on like a, a movie, like a, a film for like a movie you know, and, and it's just one representation and that, yeah, that's, that's really magical. Um, and I love the star and it's, you know, Aquarius associated with our Venuses. So that makes sense too. Um, so I, this, I don't know, this might be a weird one. I don't know. So the <laughs> card, so I chose the page of swords <clears throat> and okay. yeah I know I was like is this gonna make any sense so uh, when I did the random draw I got the page of wands and I was like hmm yeah this could work and then I was like no page of swords is better but I do like the idea of a page as related to family and lineage because um I believe and I've, I talk about this in my demystifying the tarot class I believe that the most evolved page is someone who's starting anew with the wisdom and the knowledge of what already happened. Like an unevolved page is somebody who's just like, I am, it's my first day. I don't know anything. I'm blank slate. You could convince me of anything because I'm naive and like, I'm gullible. But like um, an evolved page is someone who's like, okay, 
I went through the trials and tribulations of the ace through the 10 of swords. And now I've, I'm taking what I learned in my knapsack and I'm starting this new chapter. Um, and I chose swords specifically because I was like wands. Yeah, I love page of wands. I think of it as this like transformation, spiritual creative transformation. But I think like in terms of ancestor work, I like page of swords more because we're thinking about knowledge and how to apply knowledge and also systems of power. Um, so what I like to think about that is, yeah, I mean, like my ancestors, like I have ancestors who are direct colonizing slave owners, like how can I learn from their mistakes, you know? And yet we live in the, and I, and I have a lot of ancestors that had like brutal deaths, like horrible lives, you know, like a lot of mental health stuff and um, strife, you know, just a lot of strife. And I think like, you know, in the world that we currently live in for many people, there's like this attitude of like individualism, like whatever I thought, I'm the only one that ever thought it. I just got a new idea. I'm going to make a product called mud water and it's going to be related. Like, I, I don't know why I'm throwing that out there. Yeah. Just like people <laughs> on the internet that are like, I'm going to invent this new product and it's brand new and no one's ever heard of it. And it's like, dude, this is like another cultural practice that's been doing this for centuries. And you're just like rebranding it with your bro name on it. And then like saying that you invented it. So I kind of think like the page of swords is the acknowledgement that like, everything's already been done, you know, like pretty much everything has already been done. Um, we can't do something new. What we have to do instead is learn the lessons of our ancestors. Yeah. So like, I think specifically like for white folks, um, needing to take responsibility for the fact that white supremacy is in our hands, that we are the ones that need to dismantle it. Um, anyone that has like is part of like, uh, you know, a privileged group in society is the one that has the ownership over that um, system of power over and thus needs to be the one to dismantle it. The Page of Swords knows that because they know what the lessons their ancestors learned already was and the Page of Swords wants to learn. So like that's the thing is like I think Page of Wands would be more like about taking action, like making changes, whereas Page of Swords is in that learning position. So I guess it could be either like, um, do you need to learn and build up your knowledge base and be able to share that information and knowledge? Or do you need to take action? Um, or both, you know? Um, but I think like Page of Swords to me in this context is like anti-individualistic. It's really like, I'm not beginning, I'm not just like somebody that was born to like change the world and like do all this amazing stuff. I'm actually from like a long line of other people that did their own things and lived their own lives. And they're the only reasons that I'm here today. Mm. I think that's such a cool perspective for family. And when you said pages, I was like, hmm, you know, um, and I even think we have it in our notes for those who attend our workshop later. But like, even with the page, I was thinking the page wants to get something done. Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that they have to do it like mm -hmm. it's just a signal has gone on and something has to get done but like they each will go about their own ways of doing it and I appreciate what you brought in about like your own ancestors right because I think on the star level and I was thinking about saying this like when people say things and this is for both this is for uh non-white people but when I say non-white people I actually just mean white people who actually know their heritage hmm. because whiteness is a construct yeah. that is not long lived so it's like a facade and then your actual cultural lineage is adjacent to that and they live side by side and um hopefully adjacent means side by side but yeah <laughs> but like parallel to that and and both are true because the star to me is like the multidimensional story of your family outside of time and outside of space because we are also from a family of humanity and a lineage of, of homo sapienness and like that too. And so when I think of that on a spiritual level, obviously your ancestor like us when we're dead and gone, like, and we're back in the spirit body and completely we are going to integrate all what this was for mm -hmm. so when you're praying to your ancestors pray to the highest 
representation of them. Like don't, I tell people this, I was joking about this in my uh, Vibrite Happy Hour reading, which is if any of my descendants call upon 26 year old Sanyu, they're gonna get a very bitter bitch. Like don't call on me when I was 26. Mm -hmm. Call on me when I'm like 99. Call on me when I've been dead a hundred years because that version of me is gonna be serving up the good shit. But like, don't call on me. You could call on me at like five. I was doing well then. You could call on me at like certain, but certain ages, I was, it was a wash. So like, don't call on the worst aspects of your lineage, but also don't deny them. Yeah. So the the non worst aspects of our non white lineage, which is a direct creation of the invention of whiteness, is to actually know our lineage, and then to know what has actually been disrupted and what has been taken, and replaced with this construct of whiteness, which has its own terrible history, but it's a short, terrible history. And supremacy has been telling this short, terrible history in many different ways with many different types of faces and classes and ages and things. And we'll continue to do so because it doesn't ultimately, it's not like, it's not a holistic philosophy to say, to deny what is there. Yeah. So it's just interesting too, because absolutely, I think the page of, swords is someone who's like quick to think about it quick to think it out whereas mm -hmm. the page of wands is someone who's just going to sort of tumble in and see, like see what it's at, like on the ground in real time um but with family especially with technology like there's so much more you can know that before even if people could know it would not necessarily be easy to come by Mm -hmm. And by the time we're old and gone, our almost our entire lives will have been ha will have some sort of documentation, if not doc like literal documents that we wrote, notes, photos, us in the background of other people's photos, like random things we've uploaded to our drive, random shit we still have in our house. And so like the knowledge that descendants will have of us and of relating to lineage who we will be to the those who come after is going to be so much more intimate because they're going to be so much more informed if they want to be informed. Mm -hmm. And there'll be so much more documentation of what we actually thought, what we actually did. <laughs> Not just looking at a picture and speculating based on your ancestors who like you don't have any written documents of or anything like that. Yeah, I love that. That may that reminds me, I won't say it, but some of her notes for class about like the swords and like a modern day context and like just being like, oh, all the stuff on your Google Drive and stuff that's gonna be there after you die. I mean, it is a totally different, yeah, it's like a totally different uh time in terms of access to information and the page of swords really, yeah, really speaks to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the technological aspect of it in our yeah. day. And so does the star, right? Like the, because yeah. I call, I call what we do like the ethernet. So there's the internet and then there's the ethernet. And we, we surf the ethernet. Yeah, I love that. Um, well, is there anything else that you wanted to share about this well, topic? Yes, I'm curious. So if now that we've gone through all those, if you were to choose a six card for choosing cards to relate to individual people, entities so like, like one on one on one stuff is there any card you would think of for that just like any person in general i think so yeah any any individual person and you. I, okay i would probably pick the queen of swords you know cautiousness boundaries protection but with love because that's you know i was like well would it be queen of cups because that is such a loving emotional force but like every single person every single person would not want you know have to decipher so like that queen of swords I, that makes me think of because um yeah you can be open and you could be willing to share and willing to connect and also like have your sword to be like okay i'm done get away from me. I'm done. You know? Yeah. Well, that's funny. I also chose a swords because remember, I thought that was the, I thought the first oh, card yeah. was, the, was the first, but I chose the two of swords and I chose it. I actually really like the description that the herbal tarot has almost verbatim in here. Um, 
it's probably still my favorite two of swords description of any deck that I have. Um, but I ch I want to read it out loud so I don't like butcher it. But um, it says on um, stolen wands. Here we go. So upright, silent equilibrium with outer and inner struggles. The point of balance leading to self-acceptance and inner peace, acceptance of one's weaknesses with one's strengths. But I particularly like it for the combination of that and the reverse meaning. And the reverse meaning is juggling with the truth, the last holdout, maybe I will or maybe I won't, acting as if the outcome of a decision is more important to someone other than yourself. And I think that's the mm -hmm. money right there. Like acting as if the outcome of a decision is more important to someone other than oneself. Because the a card for relating to individual people is like, you're the one feeling the ways about the individuals. So when yeah. we feel a certain way about an individual, but then we want to create like rise raise armies to agree with us, all off your feeling, but you won't tell yourself that. Instead, you will amass an army so that you cannot have to own it on your own. You're mm -hmm. like, this isn't about me. This is about morality. This isn't about me. This is about the kids. This is it. Whatever it is for about you, whatever it is for, whatever it is about for you is about you. Because you, it's like the, it's like the lab, white lab coats, like all these sociologists being like, I don't know why they weren't candid with us, <laughs> but I will not lot like register myself as a factor of this you know of what is tempering with the experiment with the debt with the data research with the environment because i'm a neutral being who doesn't exist only my opinions exist and so i feel like the two of swords is that how honest you're willing to be with yourself and the more you deceive yourself the more deception you will just foster in your communities that then you won't trust from your families that then you wouldn't trust. Because of course you can trust people that you can't trust. You just trust that you can't trust them. That's a knowledge all of itself. That tells you all, exactly how you need to maneuver if they're doing that shit, which is away from them. So it's like, there's nothing that keeps us from being capable of learning. And I think when two of swords is balanced, that's like the light bulb. Mm. that's the thing that goes off that you say yeah humanity like I'm gonna get my shit going like I'm gonna be a person in this world I'm gonna I got something to say got I got a mark to make you know which and however that means to you and I think about that as being the sort of the starting point of how you will treat anybody mm -hmm. especially if it's one-on-one -on -one and there's no one else around to witness that that behavior so I like that queen of swords so you had two queens we had two tens we well, had mm -hmm, go ahead. oh I was just gonna say it's funny because when you picked the two of swords I was like oh because there's so many similarities between queen of swords and two of swords but then when you started like explaining what you meant with two of swords I was like dang I kind of feel called out with my <laughs> choice of queen of swords because I I was like maybe it says more about me that I'm like have your sword be ready to like defend yourself if you let yeah so yeah I was just like dang I feel called out on that one for choosing <laughs> I think them are all called out and I think that's yeah. kind of the glory of the of the write-up in the herbal tarot which in this deck is the passion flower but what I think is mm -hmm. funny about it is that it really like that's that's why you're a world mm-hmm because you build up all these concepts of society and identity and family and self and and nation and like all these topics that we went through we each have we each are listening to the same podcast at this point listener but the way that we define those concepts is not the same mm -hmm. and that constitutes our world and the way that we engage with other worlds aka other people and also what we think humanity is capable of. Um, and so, you know, this is such a, I love that we do these tarot fours because 
I think I've learned more from our sessions talking about tarot than I have from ever like reading a tarot book. Um, and I think it's because once you actually just like study mm-hmm. and and look across, and by studying, I mean like you you open the deck, you look through it, you look through a few decks, you read a few descriptions here and there, you think about what it means for you, think of the clients it's come up for, our, the times it's come up for you, how other people talk about it. Because now I can never like refer to the Knight of Wands without calling it the most dangerous card in the tarot deck because of you. Yeah. But then I, but then choosing my seven of wands, I was like, you know, how do you get to that danger? And it's because like from basically from five, you're burning yourself out. Like at basically at four, you thought it's all, you know, smooth sailing from here. And then you get to five and you're like, who the fuck are these people? But like Mm -hmm. you get to that knight of wands because of that trajectory. And I think it's interesting. Did you say ace too? Do you count your aces low? What do you mean? I think of the ace as the top. I think of the suits as starting as at two and ending oh, at okay. ace. Do you think of them as starting at ace and ending? Yeah, at I eight? think of them as starting at ace. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Did you study anthropology ever? sociology I probably took an anthropology class or two okay because I feel like some of the stuff you're saying I I have a master's in applied anthropology and then and it's a lot of times I'm like I don't use it for anything but then sometimes I'm like doing my work and I'm like no I'm totally using it because the idea of applied anthropology was taking anthropological concepts and applying them to like real life situations and I think like what you were you mentioned twice I think in this conversation something about like um and I'm probably going to butcher this, but hopefully you'll know the idea that I'm, that you're talking about. Um, it like this idea of like, you have to acknowledge the fact that whatever surrounds you changes you and changes what you're around. Like we all have Mm -hmm. that influence. And that is very much a part of like anthropological theory is that like, you can never go anywhere and that place stays the same. Like everything intrinsically affects everything else. Um, so yeah, I just thought of that because of some of the things you said, just in the fact that we can't really, there's nothing in isolation, nothing's in a vacuum. No, absolutely. And I think that that, I think that's exactly like the way that you spoke it back is exactly how I meant it. And I think that that's what contributes to my, you know, more, I, I guess we would call it more Taoist, but I think that's just because Ifa is a more like, it's a tradition that it does more it's the tradition itself is more of a gatekeeper like you can get divine for but that doesn't mean that you will eventually do divination whereas with Tao, it's like you can read the passages you can you know like mm-hmm. there there i'm sure there are secret passages that none of us know about that there are that you know Taoist masters do but for the most part you have access to the tenets of the practice um but that i think about this because there nothing is in a vacuum including like existence Mm -hmm. and so there is nothing that's unrelated in time or space because it's all existence and non-existence by definition doesn't exist (laughs) so if you're in existence that means you could actually not even conceive Mm -hmm. of what existence is not because even if you did you would be doing it with existence which is not non-existence is not existence right so it's like this mobius taurus you know shape where you're like oh my god alice down the rabbit hole it all returns to itself it's all up it's all down and that's why i like to say that we are all born with the same deck of cards the tarot but we all start at the fool and where you go from there it's a mystery Mm. but like for for the listener i'm very curious i'd be very curious to know like other how people feel about these these because you know we broke down to the best of our ability like these are not exhaustive communities uh of relation um and i'm sure there's we could do a part two on this but like self shadow nation state i kind of really like nation state as the queen of pentacles it's a more yeah you were like i thought you're like i bet you were like creed is gonna be like the devil like no i was like that's too basic like that would be so easy I mean, oh. but then like Queen of Pentacles, that's a little more challenging. Like, how do you, you know? Yeah. yeah. 
And also it made me think of when you were describing it because you were describing it from such an elevated perspective. I was like, oh, it's like Fern Gully, like the what the one Fern Gully's operating the way it's supposed to. It's just like a, this magical place. Exactly. Um, because that because I do think of uh feminine energy as creative, masculine energy as nurturing, and endogenous energy as um interact like this is not a mm. word but like interactory you know like uh yeah. or like relative um because we, we have all the things but yeah we in a femme energy you wouldn't run out because creation doesn't run out you wouldn't exhaust yourself yeah. because there's exactly. always more yeah so I get it from that and the big the big view yeah. yay another one done yeah the, i'm that this is great i'm probably gonna cut part of this out because it's like really long but um yay i'm gonna stop recording now well actually do you want to say anything before i stop recording that i will include in the recording oh thank you um well we actually started late is the funny thing so i don't know if it's yeah. super super long but i was gonna say i hope that you listener will join us at our workshop on june 12th on sunday the archaic, modern, and pop culture history of tarot. Um, we're gonna have a lot of fun uh, referencing popular figures to particular cards and giving you the opportunity to uh, do that as well. Yes, we will have little breakout rooms where people can practice the and apply the knowledge that we teach to their tarot practice and from there, who knows what future offerings will look like. Hint, hint. Um, <laughs> but yes, stay tuned for more information about the class coming on June 13th. Is that right? June 12th. 12th. Okay. Yes. On June we just 12th. decided. We just decided. It's June yeah. 12th. <laughs> June 12th. So um, follow us on Instagram, join our mailing lists, and you will be able to register. Yeah, it'll be exciting. We look awesome. forward to seeing you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead.